Hello and welcome to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Nottingham and to another of our films in the series Theologians in Conversation. Today I'm in conversation with John Milbank who is Professor here in Religion, Politics and Ethics. Hello John. Hello Simon. Um, we're going to be talking about radical orthodoxy which is a theological sensibility that uh, in many ways traces its uh, origins back to your own work. Um, but I'd like to start a little bit further back than radical orthodoxy mm -hmm. in the 1990s and uh, talk about uh, what formed your own mm -hmm. uh, theology and where you began in uh, your own theological education in the 70s and 80s. Could you mm -hmm. say something about that? Well, I arrived at Westcott House in Cambridge originally intending to be ordained. I'd been brought up a Methodist and I'd become a rather flaccid kind of Anglican. Uh, I think with fairly liberal views, somewhat sort of pantheistic. Really? Uh, right. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and um, a, a, a year into uh, being at Westcott, Rome Williams arrived there um, and he suggested that I read uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar and also Hans Georg Gadamer. Um, and as I'd never read Heidegger or indeed very much in philosophy at all, this, this took me a long, hot summer to get through. Right, only one but hot it, summer. Right. But it, it, it changed my mind about everything totally and I merged uh, uh, from the end of that summer an orthodox Christian. I remember meeting Rowan and saying yes, the grace of God <laughs> and then he passed on, <laughs> you know, up King's Parade. <laughs> Remarkable. Uh, yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think also um, talking with Rowan uh, and also with um, Alison Legg, who, whom I got engaged to, uh, um, she, since the age of two, as far as I could gather, had been a, a very orthodox Anglo-Catholic. Um, and, and I think those two people, besides my, my reading, um, influenced me um, uh, um, a great deal. Although um, I think that already I'd had, a, I, I got a very sort of platonic element in my own thinking. And that certainly, um, didn't go away at all. I, th I think what I'd found hard to integrate was, was history, that, that I understood that I, tend, I couldn't understand the place fully of Christology and, and Revelation. Mm. Um, and equally, having read history, I tended to have a rather historicist attitude, you know, that you, you, know, you just look at things in historical context. Reading Gadamer made me realize that history being historical is existential, that we, uh, and that there's such a thing as living tradition. And and then I started to connect tradition and truth. And I suppose history was then the third term uh, for me between reason and revelation. And so actually um, my sort of conversion, if you like, to, to a fully orthodox Catholic Christianity was from the outset to do with this sense that you can't make a rigid distinction between nature and grace. So, so, so it, it was reading that kind of nouvelle theology perspective that made me change my mind, which is one reason why I think I, I feel very impatient with people rejecting that perspective. Right. I feel they can scarcely be orthodox right. even. Right. Right. Yeah. You decided not to be ordained uh, and you carried on theological research, which yeah. in the end, during your time at the University of Lancaster led to the publication of Theology and Social Theory in 1990. That's right. I mean, I, I, I was very sure that in the end that my vocation was to be a lay teacher. And in fact, I found that, you know, anything pastoral that involves is quite enough for me, quite enough for me to be able to cope with. So I'm, I'm sure that was um, the right idea. And uh, yeah, initially, though, I did my thesis on Vico in philosophy. Um, uh, and really there were a lot of sideways moves and accidents and uh, I got this job as a Christendom fellow at, at Lancaster and I think, you know, they expected me to write a book about liberation theology or something and instead of which I re-explored the tradition um, that the Trust stood in, this thinking about Christendom, if, if you like, and that resulted in theology and social theory where you know, the main contention was that uh, we were all taking secular thought far too seriously. We were assuming that it was apart from religious thought. Um, we were not seeing the buried theologies or atheisms in this secular legacy. Um, and I think that that was 
sort of taking things a bit further, things I'd learned from Rowan Williams, maybe from Donald McKinnon uh, um, at Cambridge, but pushing a little further on along the line of sort of rejecting this post-war liberal legacy. I think that after the Second World War, everybody, there was a huge assumption that it now has to be liberal democracy and that we have to have a powerful secular autonomy. And the the sort of the the thinking of the thirties and forties, the sort of Catholic social teaching thinking, the Christendom kind of thinking, was rejected as too bound up with what had gone wrong. Which I think is an incredibly superficial analysis. Which actually, the finest exponents of this kind of thinking, like Luigi Sturzo, didn't fall into. And it's interesting that in fact, you know, the beginnings of the European Union are to do with a, a better recuperation of that kind of thinking, um, and not its abandonment. But I, I think that Britain entered into an incredibly superficial phase in the 50s and 60s in theology where they um, they forgot their native tradition, they imbibed the very worst of German theology, basically. And this, and this was in the 60s seen as all very trendy. Um, and, and I think McKinnon stands out as somebody standing against that, perhaps not enough, but, but at least half getting that and preserving an older legacy. And Rowan Williams also, you know, fairly isolated, I think, to yeah. begin with, and not, you know, some of his contemporaries, some of whom are quite well known in the Cambridge faculty, didn't really take that line and never have done. Um, but I think he had a huge effect when he was on Westcott, uh, Westcott on me and other people. So what was radical orthodoxy all about? Why was it so revolutionary? Um, I think you've already partly indicated why, Simon. I think uh, on the one hand we were, were insisting on the radical otherness of God and revelation in the way that Bart did, but we were also much more insisting on mediation, which is in a way to insist that Christianity makes a difference. It's not mediation in the Tillichian sense of trying to translate into categories already there, secular categories, yes. but it's a question of what difference you make. Yes. So there's this combination of a sense of transcendence, challenge, otherness, eruption, mm. and yet uh, a sense of being in the world. Yes. And I, I think what characterizes radical orthodoxy most profoundly mm. is um, the diagnosis that uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages, you lose this focus um, on participation, mm. um, which is the sense that God is mediated through the symbols and practices of the world. But at the same time, the, the way in which the Middle Ages never fully came to terms with um, the equal validity of the lay path of festivity and, and, and that sort of thing meant that in eventually the kind of enlightenment protest is is partly in in the name of and already the humanist protest in the name of the importance of politics the erotic mm. the aesthetic mm. uh everyday life if if you like mm. and what radical orthodoxy is saying on the one hand the mistake of the church is not sufficiently to think through its own participatory metaphysics and see that everything is always mediated by these things. Yeah. Uh, you could say also be more radically incarnational because my insistence would be that creation, incarnation and so on are making, are only radicalizing this platonic sense of participation. On the, so on the one hand, you have the idea that um, Christianity isn't taking that mediation seriously enough. On the other hand, you have the idea that if you try simply to celebrate these things in their own terms, they won't work. In fact, they will collapse. They will collapse into despair. They will collapse into nullity, yeah. perversity, and so on. So we use the phrase somewhat after Kierkegaard of suspending the material, yes. which is supposed to give you both the idea you're interrupting it and that it's suspended from above, right. that, that if it's trying to stand on its own feet, yes. it will no longer be there. Right. And I think it's very important to say that I think this has given rise to a mood and an ethos. And in a way that's more important the, about RO than anything. And you could say that these uh, RO tends to involve people who are at once having a lot more fun and yet are more profoundly serious mm -hmm. than most people. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of paradoxical combination and I think if you meet people involved in RO and if you go to their meetings, you feel this and people resonate with this and they start to pick it up. 
And it's also something, a, a similar spirit to some degree I've seen in other new movements that attract young people, Christian movements in Europe. For example, in, in Communio e Liberazione, it's this profound humanism. Mm -hmm. The, the, the sense that the secularity can't any longer celebrate the world. Yes. Yes. And, and I think this is the, the crucial new note. Yes. And it, it, it's, that is the existential aspect behind the stress on participation. So now 10, 12 years on from the publication of the first collection of Radical Orthodoxy essays, we've had a large number of publications covering a huge range of topics mm -hmm. Uh, from politics to theology and science uh, and so on. Um, John, where do you think the future lies now? What are the key issues that those who write within the radical orthodoxy sensibility are going to address over the next five or ten years? Well, I think they're both theoretical and, and practical. Um, I think the, the attempt to construct um, something like a theological ontology mm. Uh, perhaps especially a Trinitarian ontology, to which a lot of us have already contributed, but it remains an ongoing um, project. And I think um, the key here is um, how do we, as it were, redo the great tradition in, in the face of um, criticisms of that tradition, which may reveal ways in which even the great tradition itself has been too rationalistic in, in, in certain ways. Um, and therefore, if you want to insist on the participatory, the analogical um, worldview, you have to allow more play to, um, to paradox um, and the, the acceptance of paradox um, is in many ways primarily something emotive and imaginative. Um, and, and the sense that you can't really divorce reasoning from the whole of human life and that in the end, uh, reason itself is effective. I mean, one can see this already in Aristotle, but it needs, uh, um, I think, further development. And it, it's, it's not then an, aspect, uh, an accident that so much of the recovery of orthodoxy has been um, literary in, 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 in character. Uh, and so we need, but we need a kind of philosophical ontology um, that does justice to that, that can rethink this participatory vision, but somehow in a way that is speculative, yes, but not a sort of closed system um, that, that particularly um, allows a sense that one constantly has to redo this. So some sort of integration of the need for a speculative vision with also the sense of continuing event and the way this revises things. And then the other thing, um, the other effort, I think, is is practical. I mean, I, mean, I think in many ways um, what links these two things is the liturgical, and this is why um, Catherine Pickstock's book After Writing was so pivotal, I think, along with my own theology and social theory. But this sense that um, revelation is only ever mediated by the liturgical, that it's only when we begin to worship that God speaks to us. So our activity is, is always involved. And if you like, then we are liturgical creatures before we're linguist, uh, language creatures even. Right. Yeah, that, that is the fundamental thing um, about us. Um, and so liturgy is at once a kind of speculative act and a practical act. Um, and it's extending liturgy in, into everything, making everything in some sense an act of worship that is the key to um, practical transformations. So that I think um, rethinking um, how the church should be and, and rethinking how the political should be um, are, are the other big focuses. And they, 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 they've already begun, that those efforts have already begun. You know, having been told by various people that uh, radical orthodoxy, you know, was wildly esoteric or that my own thought was wildly utopian removed from actual politics. On the contrary, it's radical orthodoxy that's starting to have the real influence both in the church and, and astonishingly in British politics. Thank you very much, John. That's all we have time for today. We hope that you'll be able to join us again very soon for another one of our videos in the series Theologians in Conversation. Goodbye.